Okay, so today I'm going to talk about branding with yoga and ideas of yoga through space and time. Now, what I typically look at if I were to give you an elevator pitch is that I focus on collecting and analyzing the biographies of yoga and Sanskrit. And increasingly, I've come to look at Malakam, which you can think of as pole yoga. So it's, and this in itself is a kind of somewhat of a flippant way to describe it, but it, it gives you a succinct, brief kind of idea of how it relates to yoga and Sanskrit. There are many different ways in which Sanskrit and yoga are combined. And this is what I find academically interesting. And one of the reasons for this is how and why they work symbiotically. They, they, it's very hard to think about yoga without thinking about Sanskrit also. And so that's one reason why my kind of research agenda has organically evolved to consider both of these together. So you can see on this slide how in various ways Sanskrit is framed to be the language of the future, but then it's not just a language, it is a lifestyle. And how the revival of Sanskrit will help to essentially solve the world's problems because many people consider this ancient language to contain all of the information that uh, will essentially help through a, a kind of archaic modernity to revive ancient science and help the ecology. And so this is how it then crosses over with yoga and the healing power of yoga in nature. So both yoga and Sanskrit take on a very romantic or, or neo-romantic mood in the way in which they are packaged and presented to various different groups who are interested in both of these commodities. And this is one of the appeals. So the idea, generally speaking, is that Sanskrit and yoga together form a totalizing lifestyle package that will more or less just make people more ecologically friendly and therefore by just through the through the sheer practice of uh, attending to such a lifestyle they will become more sustainable so it takes on a, a deep eco-theology and what I'm quite curious about is how these assertions around what constitutes a yoga Sanskrit lifestyle how they move from just being used in marketing and sort of just general rhetoric up through to policy and law. And so I'll talk a bit about that uh, in a minute. So one of the ways in which I look at Sanskrit and yoga is through the wellness tourism, which is a huge industry around the world. It combines tourism and 
wellness, obviously. But and so together, this this is an industry that's valued at over four trillion dollars, and India is positioning itself to make the most out of its cultural symbolic capital. And you can see in the picture at the bottom that this is part of the incredible India campaign to include yoga and wellness as a way to rejuvenate one's soul. So you can see in the flowchart above the picture that at least one way to appreciate how yoga fits into wellness tourism is as part of spiritual tourism. And just briefly, the difference between wellness tourism and medical tourism is, is one of the former being proactive and the latter being reactive. So medical tourism is something that you know, you might go to Thailand to get surgery for something because you have an actual illness, uh, as opposed to wellness tourism being proactive in the sense that you attend to some activity or a collection of activities that just basically make you feel better you know, uh, de-stress, relaxing, it's or awe-inspiring, uh, you know, you might go hiking in the mountains, that can also be wellness tourism. So there are different ways to think about it, but this is a kind of a, a rough sketch. And as I said before, what interests me is how these assertions around lifestyles is is packaged by various people and institutions and one of the most uh, obvious ones is through india's president narendra modi and his assertion that a yogic lifestyle is powerful instrument to tackle climate change through changing our lifestyle and creating consciousness and yoga is a symbol of universal aspiration for health and well-being. It is health assurance in zero budget. Now, both of these assertions are, are filled with kind of vagueness. And that's what makes them curious to me. I mean, yoga is not cheap. To consume a yoga lifestyle... Is, uh, is something for the middle class and up. This is well documented and, and not a controversial thing to say. So this statement in and of itself is, is difficult to accept. But how does a yogic lifestyle tackle climate change? Surely it consists of doing something more than retweeting you know, some hashtags like yoga for climate change, yoga for STGs, SDGs. Uh, surely it does something more than, than buying a, an eco-friendly uh, yoga mat. Um, but what might Modi G or anyone for that matter mean by a yogic lifestyle? This is complicated by the fact that the term yoga has so many different meanings. And this is attested in Sanskrit dictionary where I think yoga has something like 90 different meanings. And we'll explore a couple of them in a minute. But this is also complicated by the idea that, well... What constitutes a yogic lifestyle? So, there are many different types of yoga today. And so, is there one ultimate, supreme yogic lifestyle? And does that include or necessitate the need for people to speak Sanskrit? This is an assertion that some people do in fact make. Uh... 
So it's complicated. And on top of that, what exactly might we assume is the best way to assess the impact of various lifestyles? Now, this is not uh, an easy thing to, to do, and it is something that I am invested in, in the sense that I'm trying to develop a multimodal analytical toolbox that could, in fact, measure the impact of various yogic lifestyles. And one of the ways to do that is through uh, logistics and lifestyle, or sorry, the life cycle of products. So if we were to think about various yoga lifestyles as discrete products, and then look at their life cycles, and then look at a multiple array of dimensions, three key ones being the environment, uh, the economics, and the social aspects. Then we have some idea of how the life, lifestyle impact assessment could uh, proceed. Because this is important, because there is the idea of using yoga lifestyles as a development agenda. And this links in with uh, the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, which are part of Agenda 2030. And in particular, uh, goal number 12 is about sustainable tourism development. So yoga tourism and wellness tourism become a instrument for sustainable development. And Narendra Modi has stated that the only way to successfully achieve all of the SDGs is for everyone around the world to adopt a yogic way of life. But he has never clearly articulated what this way of life consists of. So this is an issue. Now, if we start with the, the graphics on the left, so the blue colored graphics, this shows us the uh, tourism statistics for foreign tourist arrivals into India. And you can see what COVID has done for it. It has basically uh, eliminated tourist arrivals into the country, as it has in many countries around the world. So this is a challenging time for tourist-reliant economies, and particularly for uh, the project of using wellness yoga tourism as a way to develop local economies. And you can see, particularly in the yellow graphics, that there has been a significant increase in uh, both domestic and foreign tourist arrivals into the Himalayan state of Uttarakhand in North India which is where Rishikesh, the self-proclaimed capital of yoga, is located. But interestingly, in other statistics, we can approximate that the specific amount of foreign tourist arrivals who go to India for yoga-related tourism is actually only a fraction of the total number of foreign tourist arrivals into India. So we could see this as a 
in two ways. We could see it that, well, there's room for improvement, but also that, well, I mean, you know, so far the, uh, the current policies that are in place are not actually working. And there's a flip side to this as well, because tourist pollution has clearly become a problem in some of the biggest uh, tourist destinations in the world. For instance, in Venice and uh, Kyoto and Barcelona, these are three cities in the world which uh, have become overwhelmed by an annual influx of tourists. And Rishikesh is a small a small town, essentially, and it's already struggling with the uh, the current or the pre-COVID numbers of uh, of tourists, whether they come specifically for yoga or just for the cultural tourism in general. So, what is yoga actually? Now, my argument that I'm presenting in this talk is that yoga, what yoga is, depends on the context and frame and the aspiration behind its application. So yoga morphs into something different depending on who is using it and for what purpose. So yoga can be seen as a soft power instrument to change the world, as is stated in the idea that a yoga lifestyle is in an imperative to achieve sustainable development goals. And this crosses over with the also deeply ambiguous construction of a Vedic lifestyle to cure many ailments. So, I mean, is it obvious what there might be in terms of a difference between a yoga lifestyle and a Vedic lifestyle? Or do they, in fact, refer to the same lifestyle? This is something that is not well articulated, either by the promoters of such assertions or you could say, across a more general consumption of this, uh, this utopian idea. So you can find this represented and recycled in countless yoga-related websites and on yoga studio websites particularly about what yoga is and its history and its benefits, for instance. And this is a collection of some in interesting things. So let's start on the right-hand side of the page with the picture of uh, Sri Sri Ravi Shankar from the Art of Living Foundation, which is in actual fact the world's largest uh, volunteer-based development uh, NGO operating in over 150 countries around the world. And it is an interesting example of uh, faith-based development. And you could argue that what it is promoting is in fact a, a yogic way of life. So, and that's what it says in this article in the red box at the top, it says the science of yoga imbibes the complete essence of the way of life. Yet it does not explicate what that consists of. And it never normally does. This is what is frustrating to me and what makes it also curious. But if we start at the top in the, in the blue box, it says, yoga is a 5,000-year-old Indian body of knowledge. And then if we go down to the second blue box under the history of yoga, at the second red arrow, 
It then says yoga is more than 10,000 years old. Now, to me, this is just odd. Uh, is it 5,000 years old or is it 10,000 years old? It's, it's, uh, it, there's a big gap there. Now, people often say that, well, you know, no one takes these, these dates to be literal. It's just a, an effective statement that something is really old. It's an appeal to mystery and nothing more. Yet there are many people who do in fact consider these dates to be literal and true. And that is their prerogative to assert such articles of faith, which that is what they are. If we come to the yellow or green arrow in the middle of the page, Ravi Shankar says that yoga is not just exercise and asanas. And he makes an appeal to mystery to kind of back it up, that it is, uh, integrates emotions and elevates the spirit. This might in fact be true. But if you contrast and compare that with the recent announcement that through various ministries like uh, sport and human development and Ayush, the yoga ministry, uh, that yoga has now become a sport. Again, it's being classified as a sport. And I direct you to the article that I published recently in The Wire, and you can see the title of that in the bottom left corner. So, yes, yoga was classified as a sport uh, maybe five or six years ago and then declassified because it became obvious that most of the uh, limbs of yoga, so the, the eight limbs of the classically interpreted yoga, the Ashtanga yoga, uh, it became clear that how could one actually perform or compete with, say, Yamas and Niyamas, uh, you know, do you have a room cleaning competition as part of the overall yoga sport competition or something like this? So it was declassified as a sport and then recently reclassified as a sport, which includes aspirations for Olympic uh, inclusion at some point. And not only that, so yoga went from not being a sport to being a sport to not being a sport to being a sport. And now it is considered to be the mother of all sports. A bold claim. Uh, but interestingly enough, to reconsider it a sport, it has essentially necessitated amputating seven of the eight limbs to leave only asana. So yoga asana is what is considered to be yoga sport. So you can see here that there are two kind of glaring different ways in which yoga is understood to be something. And as I say, it depends on the context and the frame and the aspiration behind its application as to what ultimately determines how yoga is perceived. But we can compare that to, you know, some of the earliest mentions of the term yoga, which frustratingly are quite often not included in casual definitions. Even though many websites, many yoga studios will cite the Rig Veda as the earliest mention of yoga, they actually used an, a much later Upanishadic definition around the concept of uh, the Paraatman and Jivatman, which develop in the Brihat uh, Ranika Upanishad and the Kata Upanishad. But the earliest mentions of the term yoga are found 
only about I think 11 times in the Rig Veda across I think four four of the books I think it's one four seven and ten and one and ten are, are considered to be later additions to the to the Rig Veda but nonetheless the the context in which yoga as a term first originates has everything to do with action and martial action in the sense of yoking up to go into war and to defeat one's enemies and to rejoice in the humiliation of one's enemies and it is through the compound yoga kshema which is translated sometimes as like action and peace or action and rest doesn't actually mean peace but one way to think of it is that it refers to the binary of resting and going out into the world to acquire pros uh, property through warfare particularly cattle and to preserve one's prosperity which takes on interesting kind of connotations if we think about the many ways in which contemporary kind of commodified yoga, global yoga is, uh, which is often dealt with through misplaced criticism that, you know, Western yoga is, is not true yoga. Uh, but one could argue that based on the, the original definition of the term that being an, an entrepreneur, a yogapreneur is in fact working towards through the action of running a small business or a large business of acquiring property or wealth and securing prosperity. So that's something to consider. But there are other definitions that have nothing to do with warfare or property or or stretching or liberation. And this is this is just another one. That yoga is the proper application of a meaning of a sentence. So I mean they, these are just a couple of examples of how the ideas of yoga have changed through time and space. Now I'm going going to briefly give you some ideas of how yoga and yoga tourism in Japan have uh, been framed. And I've written a couple of papers on yoga tourism in Japan. And you can find them on my website, academia.edu or yogascapesinjapan.com. And one of the interest, most interesting ways is how it is combined as a yoga hybrid with Zen. Zen Buddhism and particularly the way in which it is located within temples and it turns out that there's both a particular sect of Zen Buddhism which seems to favor incorporating yoga options and also a particular type of yoga which is considered to be kind of Zen yoga and you can see that represented in the the top right corner so it's yin yoga so a very soft and gentle type or also uh, the Shivananda style of Hatha yoga is is also well represented and these are best understood uh, as a way in which The best way to think about this is that, yeah, I mean, they're not power yoga. That's the point I'm trying to make. You know, there's a particular kind of, a particular style of yoga which is which is preferred. And in Japanese, this is called a yutari, uh, which kind of means relaxed or gentle. But you can see how it's kind of framed. There's, you know, cherry blossoms or there's temples and there's tatami mats and and these sorts of things.
And one of the interesting things about this uh, temple yoga, well, there's two interesting things actually, is the first one is that this becomes a, a way for temples to increase their revenue streams in a very kind of tight market. Uh, there is less patronage of, of temples, particularly smaller temples, you know, out of the way that don't have the same draw or appeal to, to tourists in general. Um, so maybe one of the family members who, you know, lives in or around the temple, maybe they run a yoga class as a way to you know, uh, provide a service to the local community, but also to bring in some extra money to the temples, which are suffering quite particularly through uh, a kind of... Uh, What's the way to say it? Uh, you know, people are not giving as much money to temples, particularly the smaller ones. Now, here's just a couple of other ways to think about yoga and how it's represented in Japan. And it's very much something that is applied to the wellness of women. Uh, yoga is not particularly something that men do. It's perceived to be a domain for women. And yoga studios are also perceived to be, in some sense, a safe space for women. Um, so in many instances, the, the gender split at a yoga class is, it can be upwards of 99 to 100% even. Very rare, it's very rarely have I seen maybe one or two men in a yoga class. Um, but you can see by this that, the, you know, the idea of uh, it, yoga is something that women do. And how it's different in the West is that you know, power yoga is quite popular. Ashtanga yoga is quite popular, but... It, it takes on a, a form in the West of uh, being something that where you can kind of strengthen the body and, you know, have a kind of fit body. But that aesthetic is, is not necessarily what is appreciated in East Asia. And yoga is not seen as, as a way to maybe to get help you get, say, a more chiseled abs or, you know, wider shoulders or something but it's it's seen as a way to sculpt a more graceful or a perceived graceful feminine body uh, but then of course you can also find you know these ideas that yoga is can actually whiten the skin and if you look at the consumption of uh, you know products for whitening the skin you know, it's East Asia that consumes more than 50% of the global uh, skin whitening products. Uh, China, Korea, and Japan in particular are the, the three most, or the three highest countries in the world that consume skin whitening products. Here is a, uh, a collection of photos taken in a subway in Nagoya and you can see in the bottom left that this is a Hotto Yoga studio and it's part of a 24-hour gym. So hot yoga is essentially the more prominent uh, style of yoga and so it's seen in a kind of fitness way and you can see how you know like the the yoga is in pink and the woman's doing yoga and the mention of the 24-hour gym is in blue and the guy is there. So this shows you in some ways the binary that is presented to consumers. And the picture in the top left is also the, the far right picture in the bottom right photo. So I'm showing you two different sides of the same, uh, same train platform. 
And it might not be obvious, but the picture with the with the donkey, that's actually a advertisement for a yoga studio, uh, Yoga Lava, which is a hot yoga studio chain that has over 500 studios across Japan, most of which are female only. And uh, the text says, uh, Naze Raba, which... Basically, Raba is uh, a kind of a pun. Uh, Raba is, you know, how to say lava in Japanese, but it, it also refers to a donkey. So it's it's a curious thing uh, as to why that decision was made. To... But anyway, in the context of that train platform, you can see that there are four pictures, two of which are for yoga and fitness and the two in the middle are both for women's like beauty products like makeup so that shows you the kind of the spatial network of of how yoga is 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 framed in Japan Now I'm I'm going to wrap this up with uh, one more kind of subtopic, and it's around the idea of identity politics and social justice. The way I've come to think about various types of yoga hybrids. Uh, so I wrote this one paper last year on X plus yoga hybrids and focused on Zen yoga. And so I'm, I'm building, building on this idea in some way. And basically the way to think about all of the various types of yoga branding that is available today is to think about the life cycle of the global yoga industry and the the national kind of yoga industries as well. So they're, they're at different stages of their life cycles around the world. Some are more developed and uh, than others. But thinking globally at a macro level, we can understand that the yoga industry around the world is in a, a mature phase of its industry life cycle. And in some instances, it is utterly saturated. There are so many different types of yoga available. For instance, I mean, just the more well-known yoga hybrids of hot yoga, power yoga, ashtanga, ayenga. These are all yoga hybrids, uh, even if this is not kind of obvious but then of course we have the more or the per perceptibly more transgressive or uh, s types of yoga like beer yoga or weed yoga or uh, acro yoga you know there there are so or death metal yoga there are so, so many different types like goat yoga you know the, these are also yoga hybrids and one way to, to conceptualize this rise in social justice yoga or identity politics or identity yoga, I think is one way to think about it, is that these are actually just a new type of yoga hybrid. And they have evolved through the zeitgeist that we find ourselves in as niche ways to create distinction for one's own brand, one's own business. Putting to the side any aspiration for social justice. At a basic economic level, there is a, there is a interested economic strategy to create distinction and 
So here are three interesting examples. One is Dalit Yoga. And this is interesting for many reasons. Um, Dalit means basically to be pressed down and Dalits have sat at the bottom of the social hierarchy in India for millennia and they have taken to uh, asserting a right to practice and promote yoga as a sort of liberation, liberationary tool in a sense. And you have people like Rajiv Malhotra, who, who in one video, you know, asserts that the Dalits are essentially, uh, should be entitled to uh, teach yoga because in his words, they are more or less not smart enough to, to do, you know, higher level uh, mental jobs. And so they, they are capable of teaching yoga because they are Dalits. I mean, this, this is part of the interesting way in which yoga is framed. Now, Wayapa Work is a uh, indigenous Australian yoga hybrid, which, which, as you can see, it very much contextualizes itself as being embedded in a deep eco-theology of sorts, where indigenous knowledge is, is uh, combined with, with a yoga praxis to, to create something, again, a sort of liberationary tool, a way for in Indigenous Australians and non-Indigenous Australians to, you know, connect with themselves through movement and to connect with nature. So it again, it it, it links back to this kind of neo-romantic uh, aspiration to get back to nature, and through balancing oneself, one balances the world in a sense. And the final example is essentially uh, embedded within a critical race theory, cultural Marxist revolutionary type of situation, which is identified through the black fist, in which we understand so the idea of BIPOC or BAME yoga becoming a interesting way in which so, people of color are able to employ yoga as a way of uh, radical uh, self-intervention uh, and also in a kind of ironic way to disrupt and dismantle capitalism through becoming, mm, by by... It, what's interesting about it is basically it takes on... So if we think about BIPOC yoga, it's essentially running on the exact same operating system, the same logic that the supposedly white supremacist yoga does. It, it operates along a prosperity theology that overwhelmingly focuses on the acquisition of wealth and power. One only needs to look at how uh, arguments are made within its own literature and advertising material to see that essentially it is promoting the same ideas of, you know, do yoga to get power in your life, which is exactly what half of the articles in the yoga journal are. So you can look at Black Yoga Magazine, for instance, and you'll see that it is essentially running a prosperity cult in the same way that Yoga Journal does. But the interesting thing is that yoga appears to be something for BIPOC people 
that does not include cultural appropriation. It seems that white white supremacist yoga culturally appropriates, but black supremacist yoga is something that uh, is able to appreciate yoga. And this is some interesting kind of tension there, which ought to be discussed more. Now, one of the interesting uh, examples that I'll end on is this. So Egyptian yoga is something that really only began in the 1970s in the south side of Chicago. And it has since evolved to have several different styles, several different brands, but they all kind of run off of a, uh, a deeper Africana philosophy. And it links in with this idea that the hieroglyphics of ancient Egypt actually describe in some instances the origins of yoga. So you can see the standard yoga glyphs and the picture of this woman near the Saqqara pyramid uh, performing the same posture. And it would appear that none of this is true. Uh, one can speak to eminent Egyptologists and even learn to read hieroglyphics to a certain degree, which I've done. And well, it would appear that these, this is an invented tradition, to, to put it uh, politely, uh, which in and of itself is, I suppose, fine. I mean, I don't judge it for that. It's just an, another interesting yoga hybrid as far as I'm concerned. I'm just describing it. Um, but it takes on some really interesting, and I, I would say unintended consequences, because there are there are examples of how it it fosters a similar kind of black supremacy as does, uh, I guess, any charge that's laid at white yogis and white supremacy or Hindu nationalists and uh, Hindu supremacy. And so this is uh, something that needs to be addressed is how is it that yoga comes to foster supremacy in different cultural groups, in different social worlds? Um, does, it make, does it link back to the original definition of yoga in some way of going out in the context of war to defeat and humiliate one's enemies and stand on their heads and listen to their pleas as if they are frogs in a pond? So Egyptian yoga is uh, otherwise known as Kemetic yoga. And Kemetic or Kemet is a, an ancient term for, or an emic term for uh, ancient Egypt. And where this gets really funky is the following. So recently in the Race and Yoga Journal, uh, one article was published which essentially provides a decolonizing of yoga theology and it prescribes about 15 tenets of faith that one ought to accept and promote if they want to uh, do yoga correctly. And fundamentally, the social justice decolonizing yoga theology runs on the logic that to do yoga correctly means not doing harm to people of color. And in order to do that, one must take 
tenant number three and accept it. And so that says, a decolonized yoga honors the indigenous and heterogeneous cultures around the globe including in ancient African civilizations that have contributed to yoga's evolution and preservation. Now, this is a curiously constructed tenant because it says that yoga has it's con contributed to yoga's evolution and preservation. Now, it could say, and what it is actually saying, is that Kemet... Well, ancient Egypt is the origin of contemporary yoga. And that, so if you read the literature of this Egyptian yoga, which is basically accepted as uh, objective fact by the followers of Egyptian yoga, that yoga essentially was created in ancient Egypt, which is proved by the hieroglyphics, and it was exported to India via the Indus Valley civilization. And some of the uh, evidence that is provided are the following. So in the, in, there are some Egyptian hieroglyphics which have similarities to some of the symbols found in the Harappan seals. And... The reason for this is that they were, they are linked via like the Elamite, Proto-Elamite and Uruk cultures and the language of, of that period. So we're talking in the area of Sumeria, Acadia, so modern day Syria sort of location, uh, which took these symbols to Egypt and they flowed through extensive trade networks to modern-day Punjab, which is where the Harappan Indus Valley civilization was located. So, I mean, it's easy to first debunk that. But there is, a, there is another uh, claim that is made, which is also kind of interesting, Oh, there are two parts to it, actually. So the claim is made through um, the idea that the Dravidian-speaking peoples came from Africa and brought with them uh, the Dravidian language, which is proposed to be the substrate language of the Harappan seals. And, but this happened at a different time, possibly, if it did in fact happen in that way, uh, to, to the hieroglyphs. And there is another, another reason given that the Munda speaking people also came from Africa and brought with them African millet and that is the millet in the Dravidian speaking parts of India today still used millet, which is genetically traced back to Africa. So this is uh, these are the two kind of justifications or three justifications, I suppose, that are, that are given to uh, legitimize these claims that Egypt is the origins of, of yoga, which gifted it to India which of course flies in the face of the uh, the out of India theory, which is posited by Hindu nationalists that, that uh, not only yoga, but the Indo-European language family came out of India. But I mean, this is not supported by the genetic uh, and linguistic and archaeological evidence. So there are, there are many many ideas which contradict and of course if you if you get down into the weeds of uh, the social media and uh, you know you you find an interesting kind of war of words between followers of of Egyptian yoga 
and followers of, let's just say, Indian yoga, uh, arguing over whose yoga is older, whose culture is better, and this sort of thing, which doesn't seem too productive. But where it gets even funkier is in tenant number four, which says, a decolonized yoga recognizes yoga as broadly originated by indigenous South Asian cultures, but refuses to essentialize its history through ethno-nationalistic frameworks. This is also a, a cheekily constructed tenant, which, while it doesn't say that yoga came from only... It, it's not like disputing the idea that yoga came from Africa. It's they, 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 these two together are a, a kind of they're vague enough. There, there is a a constructed ambiguity in these two tenants. But where it gets where attention should lie in tenant number four is that it, a decolonized yoga refuses to essentialize its history through ethno nationalistic frameworks. But what it doesn't do is assert that a decolonized yoga ju just shouldn't rely on essentialized narratives full stop. Because that is exactly, in many instances, what a decolonized yoga theology does. Somehow, uh, honoring yoga's roots is... well, comes around to essentially equate to using colonially constructed orientalist imagined narratives. And the irony of this is lost on many promoters of a decolonized yoga. But to be fair, one of the other tenets is to look critically at, at other narratives. But these two in particular are quite, are quite unique in the way that they are framed. So, wrapping this up, it's important to think about the idea that yoga is not one thing. It never was and it never will be. And we have to really get our terms of reference uh, together. We have to actually agree when we're talking about yoga what what each of us means because quite often when I'm talking to someone about yoga uh, I'm not sure what they're talking about and I, I get a lot of uh, anxiety when I'm waiting for the question, you know, so do you do yoga? Or what sort of yoga do you do? And without trying to be a smart ass, you know, I might have to ask, well, I mean, you know, what, what do you mean by yoga? Uh, which then, you know, can create all sorts of fuss. But its meaning and application continue to evolve. And this also is determined by the context and the reason for its application. So this means that it's important to think critically about not only the context in which yoga is used, but also how do we both honor its roots and at the same time, avoid essentializing its biography. So, uh, I'll leave it at that, and uh, I look forward to talking to you more about yoga. If you want, you can read all of my stuff, or look, we'll look at my films, they're all on, uh, on my website, it's at yogascapesinjapan.com, or my page on academia.edu or medium so i'll leave it at that